My name is Sarah Walker. Oh, and what do you do? I'm an astrobiologist. Okay, and are we alone? I'm not sure. When I asked you that question, what did you interpret the we to mean? The we, um, living systems. So the life on Earth? Yes, so I interpreted it to be whether there was life only on Earth or whether there was life elsewhere. I see, so you didn't say we human beings? Eh? No. Okay, all right. And uh, have you ever seen a UFO? No. Uh, okay. Well, I guess I maybe I've seen things that I didn't know what they were. So if you mean unidentified flying objects in a sense, I don't know what the heck I'm looking at, then oh. yes. In the sense of, I think that's aliens, no. I see. So you've seen it. What kind of UFO have you seen then? I don't know. Lights and stuff. Lights and stuff. Okay. Now, you have, what is life for you? What, what does that mean? Um, oh, gosh. Are you talking about metabolism or is it information or what is it for you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's it. So I work on the problem of understanding what living systems are. So it's, it's actually a really difficult question for me to answer in some regard because I realize how little we actually know about the answer to that question. But most of what I think about what living systems are as, is in terms of what they do with information um, and that information is somehow the dividing line between life and not life. Um, and one of the more unique features about biological systems and what they do with information is that they innovate. Um, and so I, I think one of the things that is the most defining features of life um, is the ability to create new things based on information that exists in, in physical systems. What do we know about the origin of life here on Earth? Not much. Um, I mean, well, we have a lot of theories, um, but we don't know which ones are correct, which is why the field is really exciting to work in. Um, and I think uh, it's actually a really open question. So uh, without actually really having a clear understanding of what living systems are, it's really difficult to talk about when they originated or how they originated. And so people have different concepts that they think are important in thinking about living systems, whether it's genetics or metabolism, and those inform different uh, theories for what living systems are, um, which then inform theories for their origins. But none of them seems to capture all of the things that we would associate with life. Um, and probably in part that's because we don't really understand what sort of the core things are that really define a living system. Are viruses alive? By my definition, yes, because they're part of living systems. And prions, are prions alive? Yes. Is Arizona alive? Yes. Is the Earth alive? Yes. Is the Sun alive? Maybe a little. The galaxy? Maybe a little. The universe? Yes. An atom? It depends on what it's in. <laughs> okay. So how about the, I got a hydrogen atom inside my thumb right here. Is that alive? Sure. Okay, and I'm, I have a nitrogen that I'm breathing right now. Is that nitrogen alive? No. Okay. All right. And can you t what do you think of Woe's views of a Darwinian threshold? I like the idea of the Darwinian threshold. Um, I do think uh, that there's a lot of sort of um, views of what individuality are is in origins that might be a little bit premature. So we, we tend to take biological concepts and then say, well, where do those arise in chemistry? And can we recapitulate, bi recapitulate biology and chemistry? And so there's this idea of a Darwinian individual, um, which plays a really prominent role in understanding modern biology. Uh, and so people have tried to say that that's a really important concept with the first life. Um, but it doesn't necessarily need to be. So, um, so Woz's idea that, that maybe this concept of Darwinian evolution dominating um, evolutionary progression coming later and being actually like a critical threshold that was passed is actually resonates with a lot of things that I think about living systems. Do you think there's a, such a thing as a unit of selection? And if so, what are they? Um, I do think there's such a thing as a unit of selection, but I, I don't think that there's like an individual scale of selection, if that's a good distinction to make. Um, what do you so, mean by that? So things are selectable and they have to have boundaries, I guess, to be selected, but those boundaries can be um, in many different kinds of ways. So, um, so for an example, uh, you know, multicellular organism like myself is composed of individual cells. 
Uh, you might ask whether those individual cells are being selected or whether I'm being selected, but really we're both being selected at different scales. Um, and so um, it's, just, it's a process that occurs at many levels of organization simultaneously. So you believe in multi-level selection? I guess, but I wouldn't call it that, even though I just did. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. What part of your research is most relevant to assessing the probability of life elsewhere? Um, I work a lot on models for chemical evolution, and I suppose that's where we get the closest of thinking about probabilities for the origins of life. Um, and so that would be more about like what are the kind of processes that give you life-like features from chemistry and what are the probability of getting those processes. But I also work a lot um, more recently on thinking about detecting life on exoplanets. And, um, and I've been trying to think about statistical approaches to that problem. If you have a statistical ensemble of exoplanets, could you, um, you know, constrain the probability of life in that data set? Um, using some kind of inference procedure and knowledge about what planetary parameters were. So I guess I'm trying to come at that question from both sides, um, from sort of theoretical prediction of the probability of life and from pulling that data from large-scale statistics. A, a lot of people think that we're not alone because the universe is so big. Yes. But you didn't say that. No. Why not? Because I don't think that that's a reasonable argument. Because? Because... Um, we don't know what life is, and just because something's big doesn't mean you have a lot of something. Um, and so I think uh, one of the things, I mean, one of the reasons in that, and you've written about this obviously, but one of the reasons that um, people um, you know, think that life might be common is because life emerged uh, really quickly on Earth, um, and therefore you could extrapolate to other scenarios that maybe life is, it just gets started easily. Um, but I think without knowledge of that process, it's really difficult to make those kind of arguments. And so, so far, we know of one sample of life, um, which is the biosphere that we have on Earth. And um, we're obviously a product of that biosphere, so it makes it really difficult to extrapolate how common life should be um, when, you know, we could very well be on the only planet in the entire universe that has life. And that would be where we had to be in order to do the science that we're doing, um, because otherwise we wouldn't be there. Some astrobiologists think that it's important to figure out what functionality has emerged or evolved multiple times independently on Earth, yes. and then if you can find what those features are, then they become good candidates for what we should expect elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Do you, is that, does that make sense to you? It makes sense to me, it's not the way that I think about the problem, um, I'm more interested, I guess, so, so functionality is hard because it's difficult to define and it's usually context dependent. Um, and so I find personally that to be a challenging way for me to think about the problem. I prefer to think about what is the structure of biological systems, why are they organized the way they are, and what, what are they doing, like what are they as physical systems? Um, is there a problem? I, I, it's difficult not to anthropocentrize these, these questions, but I'm going to anthropocentrize them, so I'm just giving the caveat that I'm just doing that. But, but is there a problem that, that the universe has that life solves? Um, is, um, you know, but from the perspective of physics, um, so, so a typical one might be entropy production or something that people might make arguments for. I'm not really sure that I'm convinced that's the right one, but, um, but I, I tend to approach it more from those perspectives than thinking about function. I think universal features would emerge out of whatever the physics of living systems is, and that some of these things, like the functions that we see, might be particular motifs that are associated with that physics. Now, are you suggesting that there are particular motifs that evolve independently, and if you can show that they evolve independently on Earth, then we should expect them elsewhere? Um, so instead of functionality like eyeballs or powered flight, you're replacing well, those two yeah. things with organizational pattern or something? Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, part of the reason that those similar patterns emerge on Earth is because the laws of physics are the same, and so you would expect if you, you have the problem you need to solve of seeing things, there's only a certain set of ways that you can do it, um, and therefore eyeballs have emerged many times. Um, so I guess, uh, yeah, I, I suppose I would replace the concept with, with kinds of organization. And I do think that there's something interesting about <laughs> life, which is usually, um, it seems to be simpler to explain at like a systems level, but when you look at the individual parts, they're highly contingent um, and, and context dependent. 
Um, and so, um, so when you talk about these things emerging independently many times, that's usually because of a particular context. But if you looked at the pattern of, say, the biosphere as a whole, it might have much more statistical regularity. Um, and so one example people will commonly cite is um, scaling laws associated with like metabolic rate. So metabolic rate um, scales as a function of body size across several orders of magnitude um, in the biosphere from like mice to humpback whales. You're you talking can, about animals. Yeah, animals, but also for microbes. People have done scaling laws for, for microbes. Um, and so it seems to be, you know, but that's a macroscopic, that's a, a large scale pattern that emerges when you look at many, many, many individuals. And so I'm really intrigued by the idea that maybe some of the, the things of life that might be more universal are at the level of properties of lots of individuals rather than individuals. Um, Stephen Jay Gould has talked about replaying the tape of life, going back yes. to the Cambrian explosion and saying, oh, nothing like human beings would ever evolve again. And Simon Conway Morris says, oh, you know, if Homo sapiens would evolve again. Yeah. Do you have a take on that issue? Um, I think something like humans would evolve again. I don't think it would be humans. Why do you think something like humans would evolve again? Um, so I think that there are constraints on the, the properties of, like, populations of individuals, so these, these large-scale properties I was just talking about. Um, so there are, there are fundamental physical constraints, and then there are solutions about what roles individuals could have within that set of constraints, and there are a certain number of solutions to that kind of problem. Um, and so uh, within that space, humans is a solution within a set of other biological entities and environmental entities. But isn't every species a solution? Yes. So that means we should expect Indian elephants on, on No, I, I'm, I'm saying that there, there are certain sets of solutions and they have certain properties associated with those sets of solutions. And so it's, it's more like your eyeball example than the Indian elephant. It's, it's less specific to a specific species, but it might be specific to a certain set of constraints. So you think vision is something that would evolve multiple times or we should expect in the aliens? If they have a son. <laughs> They'll, they'll, maybe they'll have a son, but they, maybe they might not have a head. Maybe they won't. But do you need a head to have eyes? Well, do all eyes belong, have come from heads? No, I don't, I don't think so. Where, give me an example of eyeballs I, I, heads. I thought there was an example of a bacteria that had a photoreceptor that was sort of like an eye. Well, there are lots of photoreceptors. Yeah, yeah. So so I, people, I think but it's most people wouldn't call them eyes, but you're, yeah, well, you're willing sure, to call them Sure, why an eye. not? Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Do you think RNA preceded DNA? Yeah, I do. Why? Um, because I've been indoctrinated to think so. <laughs> okay. If I gave you $100 million, I'll give you $100 billion at the caveat you have to spend it to try to answer the question, are we alone? How would you spend it? Um, I would build a fleet of CubeSats to do a large statistical sample of exoplanet atmospheres at lower resolution maybe than people want to and try to generate statistics. Um, and the atmosphere than, compositions of sure. Earth-like planets. Uh, yeah, Earth-like or otherwise. Basically, actually, whatever planets we have the, the highest confidence that we can predict their abiotic properties. I would pick those planets and do a large statistical sample of those planets. Of the abiotic ones? Ab well, we have the ability to predict them with high accuracy what we think those planets should be like. And that might not be Earth-like planets, but whatever planet type, not necessarily Jovian planets, but terrestrial type worlds, we can predict its properties with the greatest accuracy and collect as much data on those planets as possible and then try to see if our, our predictive models fit the distribution of those planets in terms of their composition and then look for anomalies. So you wouldn't uh, involve, you wouldn't invest in uh, SETI? Well, SETI could be part of that, um, I suppose. Um, I might invest in SETI. I mean, I think SETI it has a really um, strong thing going for it, which is technological signatures probably will be more unambiguous than other signatures if would we you, could identify them. Would you invest in uh, buying microscopes to look for nano aliens? No. Why not? Because I think that every planet has one biosphere and that's it. I don't think that there's alien life on Earth that's disconnected from biology that we already know So you don't know think there are little nano aliens in this room flying around listening to us? Well, it's, 
<laughs> How much detail do you want? No. Yeah, no, I don't think so. I'll do just, you think yeah. that we're inside of an alien? No. Why? That we're inside an alien? Yes. Like, you know, you have your neurons inside your brain. Those neurons don't know they're part of your brain, and so maybe we're inside of an alien and we don't know it. Oh. I, I, I guess it's just, it, it's kind of like, well, what are you de defining as an alien then? I don't know. Yeah. Um, we don't have definition of I life. I mean, I guess that's a question I don't, I don't know the answer to. I mean, anything's possible. But you wouldn't buy microscopes with your money. Well, the, no, I mean, the reason, I, I mean, I have very clear reasons why I don't, I, I, I think rather than buying microscopes to look for alien life on Earth, it's better to build quantitative theories based on the biochemistry that we know. And I think there is a lot of regularity to the structure of biochemistry. And so I'd like to see more effort of looking for alien life on Earth, trying to actually look at the, the structure of living systems on Earth and look at what pieces could still fit in that structure and be self-consistent rather than spending money going to look for fishing experiments, I guess. Mm. Okay. Do you but that's because I'm a theorist and mathematician and I want more money thrown our way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or just because I think it'll be a faster way of doing it. <laughs> now, do you have a favorite solution to Fermi's paradox? Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I was always amused by the cosmic zoo hypothesis, uh, so that might be my favorite just because it's funny. You have um, one that's favorite based on rationality rather than it's um, fun? Yeah, I mean, my favorite based on rationality is I really do think that fundamentally we do not have a clue what living systems are. And so I don't think that we, we know at all what we're looking for. So I don't, I don't think it's a paradox because I, I just, I don't think that, I don't think we would know it if it was smacking us in the face. Okay, could you close your eyes mm. and let me ask you, what kind yeah, of aliens fine. would you like to find? Your emotional self, please. See. Some kind of sci fi alien. I don't know which one. Some kind of sci fi alien. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I'd want to meet aliens that were, this is really bad. Say that again? Were, that were really good scientists. You'd like to meet really good scientists. Yeah. So you'd like to meet yourself? Maybe. <laughs> I guess one doesn't everybody, I guess. Is the question, are we alone, an important question? Yes. Why? Um, because I, well, I think it's an important question. Um, the question itself has merit just because it makes you do a lot of self-reflection and um, you know think about what you are as a living system, uh, what is humanity is. Self-reflection good. Yep, but it's a more important question because if we actually had an answer to it, I think it would it would change everything that we think about ourselves. Is that good to change everything you think about yourself? I think yourself? so, but I'm a scientist, so. I like. You might undermine the very reason you get up and then we all die because we find out that we're meaningless or something. Wow, you are really pessimistic. I'm optimistic. Well, the aliens probably don't think much of us, maybe. And they would say, you know what, we have a religion, we're more powerful than you, and you are worthless. You're like an amoeba. I mean, Where do you get this stuff? <laughs> well, if we, just, if we look at amoebas, we don't talk to them, we don't think. But imagine if amoebas figured out how to contact us and we had a vision of them that was, we don't care about you, you're crap, then that might oh, you guys are more powerful than us, so we'll have to adopt your religion, so we're crap, and so we'll, they get drunk, and then they kill themselves. Right. I'm just worried about humanity discovering an advanced civilization that would uh, treat humanity not as God's gift to the universe, but rather just so amoeba, crap, bacteria, something that you don't respect. I, I, just, I just, I mean, I, I know a lot of people make those arguments. I just, that's not how I feel about it. I don't, I don't think that, like, if we did meet aliens, that they are going to intrinsically be... Um, you know, trying to outcompete us or think that we're the grime under their feet. I think that they would be as curious about us as we are about them. Really? I guess because they're good scientists, because that's what you want to meet a good scientist. I guess alien. so, yeah. I yeah. see. You don't want to meet a I, dominatrix I, or something. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but maybe they put us under a microscope. Who knows? So you, you said something about the find out who we are, and, and what's the, why is it that good or necessary or important to find out who you are. I mean, some people, I've seen people who are very self-conscious and it keeps them from dancing. Yeah. And if, so self-conscious is not always a good thing. Right. Um, I mean, it's a really tough question because I, I feel like, you know, some people have an intrinsic drive to just want to know things and other people don't because maybe knowledge scares them. Um, and I... I don't really, I mean, I, I fundamentally, I just don't understand that viewpoint because so much of what drives me as a person is wanting to understand things. Um, so that might just be a personal bias. But I feel like 
a lot of the story of human civilization has been about increasing our knowledge about the world around us and about ourselves and that when we do make major leaps in our understanding, it's ultimately for human benefit. Um, like humans' lives have gotten better over time because of that. Um, and so I feel like if we did have this, this, this big change um, by realizing that we weren't alone, which may or may not be a big change for all of us, because I certainly know that there are people that don't realize we're not alone. I tried to buy a car last year, and the woman that was selling me the car thought there were plants on Mars and was shocked to learn that we really were the only plant that didn't even have plants. Um, so, so when I, I, I guess I feel like it would just be such a radical change in our state of knowledge, but maybe that wouldn't be the case for everyone. But, but when I say a radical change in our state of knowledge, I guess maybe I mean at the collective level um, of, of humanity writ large, um, and that that would really change um, the future of our civilization um, in ways that maybe are, are right now unpredictable. Um, not just because of the contact and like maybe communicating with aliens, but also because of this intrinsic, like this change in our understanding of what life is, how ubiquitous it is, and, and what our place is. Have you seen the movie Contact? I have. At the end, there's a little kid who asks Jodie Foster's character. Yeah. Says, uh, are we alone? And Jodie Foster says, well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space. Yes. What do you think of that comment? Um... I don't think it's a waste of space if we're alone. I mean, I guess I, it could be a waste of space, but I think, I mean, for me, be, being a physicist that studies life, I think the most significant thing about our universe is that there is a planet with life. Now, if there are more than one planet with life, then that is really quite extraordinary. But just the fact that there's one already makes our universe a pretty special place. Special? Mm-hmm. And why is it special? Well, I'm not sure life. that every universe can think about itself. And you think we're thinking about ourselves? Well, we're in the universe, we're part of it, and we are thinking about it, so but, technically, yes. But now you're using the we for homo sapiens rather than the whole biosphere. Before, when I asked you, are we alone, you said it was life on Earth. Now you're talking about awareness and self-consciousness. I, I presume, are you talking about animals then, or are you talking about homo sapiens? Um, I guess I'm talking about, I'm talking about homo sapiens now. Um, are Homo sapiens alone on Earth? No. Okay. Now you teach astrobiology. Yeah. What are the biggest misconceptions that some of your students have about astrobiology? Um. I don't. I. I think. I think one of them is a lot of people get into astrobiology because it's a, a cool thing. Like you know, there's all the hype about aliens and movies and things, and and maybe. Um, the thing that I like to see in my students is when, when they come from that enthusiasm and they transition into realizing that this is a really quantitative science and it's quite hard um, and, and challenging and, and in good ways. Um, but not every student is prepared to, to make that transition. And so sometimes it's, they come in because of you know, the cool factor, um, but they, you know, the breadth of issues and things that we face is, is really quite challenging. And so making that transition into really thinking quite critically about these questions and moving from sort of the media misconceptions to the, the critical questions we actually have to address in the coming decades is, is not always the easiest transition. So it's not just cool, it's hard. Yeah. And any other misconceptions? Um, well, I mean, there's tons of misconceptions about living systems and what they are. Um, and so, I mean, there's a lot of uh, people who never, I mean, actually it's interesting because most people don't really think about what life is. Um, and so, so that question has lots and lots of misconceptions. Um, What's the biggest one people have about that? I mean, my personal opinion is thinking that replication is just, you know, the absolute critical thing that life does. And I, I just, I, I don't think that, but that, that may be, you know, is, is a community consensus in some areas and, and not all areas, but, but, um, but that, that might be one. Well, a lot of biologists think that life self-reproduces. Yes, because it, it does. Well, I, I tell all my students that it doesn't because if I take a female and a male and put them oh, in true, a hermetically sure. sealed capsule, yeah. they all die immediately. Yeah. So I say that all life 
forms are dependent on other life forms, and so yeah. therefore the idea of self-replication yep. is, okay. is not an issue. Yep. But everybody says that's what. Right, they're. right, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I agree with that. I, I, I think, yeah, I mean, I just have a problem with, with the way, the language of talking about self-reproduction and replication is, is um, can be very misleading. Do you have any advice for students who are thinking about becoming astrobiologists? It's an awesome thing to do. You should totally do it. <laughs> so you're a happy astrobiologist. I am a happy astrobiologist. I love what I do. I think um, it's an amazing set of questions to be able to work on. And um, if you have the passion and drive and enthusiasm to do it, it is such a great community to work in. And are we alone? I'm not sure. And, and why? that's why I do what I do because so, I want to know. Okay, so what is it about you do? What it, what is it about what you do that tries to address the question? Are we alone? How is your research connected and relevant to answering this question? You asked me this question already, didn't mm -hmm. you? Okay. Um, you look too noisy. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So I I do a couple things. I I mean I I think the question of are we alone requires understanding one the distribution of life in the universe and two um, well like by empirical observation I mean so actually going out and looking for alien life and the second one is actually trying to figure out from first principles what the probability of getting life is so you can think about it as you know coming from origins of life what's the probability of getting life and life evolving on a planet and then actually going out and observing what that distribution is. And so I, I started working in origins of life, and I do a lot of work there trying to understand um, what living systems are, how can we quantify life, and then what's the probability of those properties that we associate with life emerging from chemistry. But I also have more recently gotten interested in trying to get directly at the distribution of life question um, by working um, in the exoplanet field on thinking about large statistical samples of exoplanets if you could actually get constraints on the probability of life from those kind of data sets. What do you think of the Gaia hypothesis? Um, I think it was ahead of its time in some ways, um, in a lot of ways. I think a lot of people uh, discredit that because they think it's you know touchy-feely for like thinking the planet's alive. Um, but, but the way living systems operate is by changing the systems that they're in and that includes the Earth system as a whole. And so everything about Earth as it exists now, or, or most things about Earth, are really defined by the life on this planet. And life is also defined by you know, the geological and geochemical properties of the Earth system. And so those two systems are, are very tightly coupled. And there's, you know, in my, in my definition, or my, my way of thinking about living systems, the kind of theoretical, uh, approach to the problem that I think is most fruitful is thinking about living systems um, being a, a dynamical process that includes changing the systems that they're in as, as they, so, so Earth as a whole would be included in that process and then it becomes part of whatever living system is. Now, Carl Sagan had a debate with Ernst Mayer about whether we should expect aliens, uh, mm -hmm. human-like, human-like intelligent aliens, and Carl Sagan said that there were well, he, I guess he believed that there were functional equivalent of humans out mm -hmm. there in outer space. What do you think? Functional equivalent of humans in outer space. I'm not sure. I'm really not. I, I mean, so... You're wearing I, the Sagan Net Org, so... I, I thought, know, I, oh, I've got, a, yep. I know, my little advertisement. I've got my blue marble one, too. Um, the, yeah... So there's, there's this interesting problem um, with thinking about life that's very hard, which is in part because we only have life on Earth to go by, which is whether intelligence will always evolve, intelligence being like a technological civilization or human-like intelligence or not. Um, and so I, I have um, often made the argument, which I think maybe you disagree with Charlie, but, but that there seems to be a trend of increasing complexity with time in the biosphere as a whole. And, um, and I struggle with whether that's a generic property of living systems or not. And I think my viewpoint is once you get into life, 
whatever life is. I, I don't think it's like a black-white boundary either. I think whatever physics underlies living systems is actually more ubiquitous than in life. Um, but it's just that it gets amplified in living systems. But once you get into to this living domain, that those systems tend to um, uh, create more complexity as a function of time. Um, and what I mean by that is they, they change the systems they're in and that dynamic then feeds back and, and leads to further refinement. Um, and, and the Complexity, so you think complexity. the universe is becoming more complex? Well, so the way, not, not the entire universe, but, but local parts of the universe, um, and, and the way I usually like to, to talk about this is to use an example of satellites, um, because it's, it's just, it, it, it helps visually, I think, with articulating what I actually mean. Um, but, um, but the Earth, like a, a non-living Earth, um, has one satellite, the moon. An Earth with a technological civilization on the surface of the planet has thousands of satellites and is anti-accreting them into space all the time. Um, and so there's a lot of, a lot, a lot of states, um, a lot of possible configurations of the Earth system with lots of satellites that are enabled by a technological civilization with um, inf its information processing capabilities um, to, to generate. Um, but there's very few, there's a lot fewer possibilities of having Earth with moons or satellites um, if you just let the laws of physics alone handle it, um, at least the traditional laws of physics. Um, and so I think, um, I think what life is doing is um, increasing um, the number of states that, that the Earth system can actually maybe achieve as a function of time. So it's, it's a complexity, but it's, it's more about sort of accessibility of state space. Maybe that's too complicated. For <laughs> well, is, that, is the increase in complexity another way of saying a uh, 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 way of making more entropy? Yes. Arthur C. But it's, yeah, but, it, but it, yeah, it, it's a little different than entropy, and it's too subtle. Anyway, Arthur, is it, it's not time for us to go yet, is yeah. it? What time no, is it? I don't know. What time? Uh, what time is it? 6.30. Oh, my okay. God. Okay. Yeah. Well, but, we probably should take a little break before the panel. Okay, one more question. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, Arthur C. Clarke said that, uh, that uh, sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Yeah. And then a guy named Carl Schroeder says, no, you're wrong, Arthur. Sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from yeah. nature. What do you think of that? Uh, I'm more on the side of magic. <laughs> okay. Magic constrained by the laws of physics. <laughs> okay.